everyone, and welcome once again to Liberty.me Live. <laughs> uh, I'm your host, Mike Reed, and tonight we're going to try something completely different. Uh, this is a book launch party to celebrate the release of Frank's, uh, Frank Markopoulos' new collection of short stories, Infinite Ending. So there's, there's no ama uh, amazing plan beyond. We're just going to talk, laugh, drink, and I'm going to hear from one or two of the stories, too. Now, because it's a party, we want to see everybody, or at least everybody that wants to be seen. Uh, so whoever you are in the crowd, we've enabled your microphone and your camera. If you look at the top center of your screen, there's a button that looks like a microphone and a button that looks like a camera from the year 1995. And you click those two buttons, and then you click Start Sharing, and we should be able to see you. Now, if you have any technical problems, Matt, get around that like a 95% uh, success rate in straightening them out. Uh, so uh, I think we've already got a lot of people uh, coming on here. John Hunt has come back. That's wonderful. So I'm hoping we'll see a, a few more people. I'm just going to give a, uh, I'll just wait a minute to see if anybody else uh, can get their setup working. And then we'll talk about the book itself. Actually, that's not true. First of all, do some introductions. <laughs> Mike, do you think uh, there's any hope that Blues Traveler will show up? <laughs> well, we left a seat just for them, and uh, we've set a, a special audio channel so that the like the acoustic guitar and the the harmonicas will come through perfectly. Awesome. So I think they might. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hopeful, man. Great. Uh, call, call me an optimist, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> okay, um, so just like any ordinary party, I just want to start with introductions because I think I know everybody, but I'm not sure everybody knows me or uh, know each other. So I just want to do some like introductions, both the people who you can see and the people who are just in, in text, just so we know who's here uh, in the party. And then the plan is to start with a little drinking game that Frank and I have devised. Uh, in which Frank, Frank reads part of his story, and uh, we look for keywords inside the, inside the story, and then it's just a party. So uh, I'll start with introductions. I'll try and keep it quick. I'm Mike. I'm the Liberty.me publication impresario, so I'm in charge of the books. I'm in charge of the guides, and I get to do all kinds of cool, uh, fun events like this one uh, with Frank and Tracy and Jeff and John Hunt and everybody else. Uh, so that's me. Uh, I live... Uh, near Winnipeg, so I'm in the frozen north here, and I live with my wife and uh, two beautiful young children. <laughs> oh, that makes me so jealous, Mike, because uh, I'm living here in Austin, Texas, and all, all I've got is my uh, pet Tetra, Fredward. <laughs> and <laughs> no children, no wife, um, <laughs> but I guess that's... Uh, that's all you need to know about me, and I wrote this book that we'll be talking about. <laughs> yeah, instead of a wife, you have a book, so that's impressive. I don't have a book. I think about each you, one Jake? of these ten stories. Each one of these ten stories is like one of my children. Now, how about that? I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah, um, my my book. I always call it my inking paper child. So yeah, I'll buy that. That's uh, no, I'm I'm just north of you in Dallas. Um, my husband just left. My daughter's in college. I'm a writer, choreographer, and uh, glad to be here, ready with my shot glass. So, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm Jeff. I'm in Houston. It looks as though like <laughs> quite a few. Ah! <laughs> and I live here with my wife, and my kids are grown. I'm older than dirt. <laughs> Both Tracy and Jeff are uh, being uh, somewhat uh, shy or perhaps over overly humble here. Tracy has a wonderful novel that we featured um, called Counteract, and we Counteract, and we featured that recently. It's a young adult dystopian fiction novel. And Jeff Riggenbeck, of course, has a fantastic uh, podcast which we run on uh, Liberty.me. Great. And how about uh, you guys? Uh, I would love Ken and Zach and other people who are in text. I would just love to, to see if you want to text from you telling us who you are. And, and we'll let Matt Gilliland talk to you at the end, but we try to keep it caged. <laughs> oh, Zach and Ken are typing. 
Mm-hmm. This is a weird <laughs> thing to have some 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 people in the room and then some people live. <laughs> okay, we, we got Ken. We got Ken. He's a he's a curmudgeon hiding out near Nashville. Wow, you guys are all way down there. <laughs> Is there anyone within 1,000 miles of my house? That's what I want to know. No. <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's the re-rise of the South, Mike. <laughs> yeah, wow. So that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> Ken says it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really funny because uh, two days ago it was negative 30 here. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Oh, that is that. remote, dude. <laughs> and how about you, Matt? Tell us who you are. Oh, I am the program director for Liberty Me Live, and I. That's pretty much my entire life, so. <laughs> that, uh, that is not Jeff, true. That is not even true. Jeff Riggenbach is the, the voice of my inner monologue thanks to <laughs> hundreds of hours of audiobooks. So, uh, thank you for the wonderful narration of my innermost thought. Yeah, so if, if Jeff says something in this conversation, how can you tell whether he's saying it or you're thinking it? Ooh. I guess I can't, but, like... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, thing, the thing about it is, um, generally, when when Jeff speaks in like my inner monologue, which probably says something about my inner monologue, he uh, he says things that I've heard him say as you know the the narrative voice of uh, Murray Rothbard or whoever. So it's like uh, fourteen barrels of fish, fifteen <laughs> barrels of fish, a horse. <laughs> <laughs> so that's um, yeah. My my wow, inner monologue is a huge nerd. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful, that is well, so it's real. Bad Mike. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you again, and to meet a couple new people too. Ken, Zach. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, start, now that we've done introductions, we're going to, I'm going to explain the drinking game briefly, and Frank and I are, are definitely going to play the drinking game. I think Tracy's ready for it with vanilla vodka as we speak. <laughs> I have a cold, I'm, I'm, it's medicinal. Isn't this medicinal? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the game is dead simple. Uh, Frank's going to read the first short story in the collection. Uh, he thinks it's about five or six minutes long, but we're going to end up interrupting him with the game all the time. So it's probably going to take like ten minutes, not enough. And uh, in this uh, story, there's a recurring theme of the color red and various hues and tints of red, like pink. Uh, so, uh, so any time that you catch Frank saying, uh, red or pink or amber or anything else that's kind of in that spectrum, any other color that's in that spectrum. Uh, Frank and I and uh, Tracy and you, if you're drinking too, have got to drink. Uh, I have this uh, fine glass of amaretto, which as I was saying is the first uh, liquor I've purchased in about three years. And Frank has uh, Hendrix in his red glass. Tracy has, has her medicinal uh, uh, vanilla vodka. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> You've got uh, whatever you like at your own home. Okay, so Frank, can you tell us just a little bit of background? Is this is this the first story in the collection? Like when I opened the book, is this the first uh, story in it? Yes, it's the very first story. I think of it as the kind of the leadoff batter in a ten-person softball. That doesn't even make sense, but it's the leadoff batter for this for the book. <laughs> yeah, that's and I think that's why it's so short. <laughs> it's very, it's very telly. Tracy, you'll understand what that means. It's very mm -hmm. telly. I'm not showing a lot here. I'm just telling a lot. So, cool. All right, well, go for it, Frank. Uh, so, uh, do interrupt if Frank says a word uh, that fits the list. Let, let us know because Frank won't. Frank will just try to get away with this here. So, let us know if you catch it. <laughs> 
So if they catch me, they have to say what? Drink or something like that? Yeah, drink or red. <laughs> like red in all caps. <laughs> or pink. <laughs> red. All right. All right, so we're ready? I have the story ready. in my hand. All right. Uh, story is entitled Talk. The meatpacking district is trendy now. It didn't used to be. It used to be full of fat Italian guys smoking stubby cigarettes inside the cabs of loud, exhaust belching, graffiti stained trucks delivering meat. Now, every night of the week, networking parties rage inside spaces formerly used for the production of meat products. Socialites like Allie are often found as she was now, standing with a crystal flute full of pink champagne in her dainty hand, greeting trust-funded hipsters before... Oh, oh. See, now that was me. <laughs> pink champagne? Right. Like, you guys, yeah. Drink? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they should have to drink for being late on it. Yeah, drink twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh. <laughs> well. All right. Well, we're we'll we'll talking. So that's, that's how it's going to work. Yeah, we're all okay. talking. Sorry. <laughs> uh, pink, pink champagne in her dainty hand, greeting trust-funded hipsters before they enter the buy invite only hot spot. The fat Italians are not invited. They're all in Hunts Point now, anyway, or that's how it seems. The sad reality is that then and now, here and there, it's all a hazy white, na white noise blur. Allie, by birth, I will Asha Rai, stood like the proper finishing, girl school, finishing school girl she was, obelisk straight, her hair like black silk flowing over her dome sloped shoulders. Reconning the scene, Allie's perfect posture reminded me of 7th Street, that row of nearly identical Indian restaurants where we tried to get Allie to give up the goods on three major players in a global money laundering operation. She was standing that way all through the interrogation, never wavering under the pressure. We failed to get the information we needed out of her, but that doesn't mean I can't be nostalgic about it all. What drives you, Peter? Allie had whispered to me over tandoori chicken before the interrogation in the kind of romantic, airy voice that can make even the rumbling New York City delivery trucks sound like Aeolian harps. Her perfect posture windswept into her sweet voice in my ear. That's one of those tricks of the mind that can seem cruel or kind, depending. I looked at my watch, 2100 hours, almost time to go. The watch itself used to be quite handsome years ago, a watch any man would be proud to wear in a congressional hearing or out in the real world. Now, though, it's got little nicks everywhere, scratches on the black metal band, tiny bits of grime along the rim of the face. Sure, it's distortion-free crystal with all kinds of high-tech features, but it still bears the wounds of time and high-risk ops. What happens when you successfully complete your training? Well, one of the things, anyway, is that they give you a $1,000 keepsake. This one was all shiny and awe-inspiring and manly back then. Now it's all beat up and dirty. A rotting shame, really. Allie, by contrast, wore a perfect round pink locket with a sterling silver edge on the key. Thank you. On, on a chain around her neck. The locket I knew contained a creased black and white photograph of her mother who had contemplated who had complimented her daughter's elite education in New Delhi with comprehensive lessons about every faith on earth, teaching the child early on about the true power of beliefs. What, Allie had asked me over Shiraz and red velvet cupcakes, or who has made you believe in these ideas? Freedom, traitor, justice, what are these things, really? I laughed when she said that that night. What else could I do, really? It was an uncomfortable laughter, but I cleverly covered its tracks by z sipping some zesty wine. I smiled and held my brow in a sophisticated pose, joked about her rhetorical games. But it stuck with me. It stuck with me. No matter how much I knew about emotional manipulation, sometimes 
simple truth broke through the defenses of my training regardless. Outside the meatpacking district warehouse turned red. Allie's silky red dress rippled in the breeze, and I knew it was the same dress she wore to a gala at the Princess Hotel in Acapulco. A gelée in her henna-adorned hand. Take these cards. The red dress. Uh, but Tracy's muted. We can't hear Tracy's beautiful voice. <laughs> I can hear you now, Tracy. <laughs> but otherwise, Mike, if somebody else catches me, I can't see them, so you got to tell me. Oh, oh because you're looking at page. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tra Tracy, uh, Tracy and I will we'll shut you down. <laughs> uh, all right, now I have to figure out where I was. All right, here, here's where I was. And I knew it was the same dress she wore to a gala at the Princess Hotel in Acapulco, a bougie in her henna-adorned hand, her hair fixed into a braided ponytail. She knew it was the kind of dress that, on her body, manipulated men's minds in ways she could use. Even a trained operator has a hard time shaking primitive instincts. Live in the eternal now, beyond all perceived dimensions and limitations, she had said over cocktails at the breezy hotel bar. That was her response, her answer. I had asked her how I could possibly live in a time world where everything was all jumbled together in four nonlinear dimensions. I had a joke about never Ever being late for a meeting, and then that's what she said. Like I've been trying to explain, the lady is trouble. At the time, though, I didn't realize just how much trouble she was. I thought she was just another rich girl playing the traditional game of dialectical finance, funding the arts and other worthy causes on one hand, and shady, often violent organizations on the other. But Allie was no ordinary target. Allie always had objectives all her own, and sometimes I thought I could see just a glimpse of the rot beneath the gray surface. I her advice to heart, tried to live in the eternal now, as best I could understand the concept. Real trouble came when my deep cover was blown after I confused all the goddamn dates and the goddamn people and places, the alleged facts. I got mixed up about what had happened and when, what had happened to me. The big boys don't need operators who can't keep their stories straight, especially under their relatively mild interrogation techniques. I'm lucky to be alive, I guess. That's what they told me anyway before they kicked me out. See. The frosted glass door burned. Something in Allie's dark, dazzling eyes told me she knew I was here, not only back in New York, but right behind this wall watching her. I got the feeling that, worse than not caring, she enjoyed it. She knew, somehow, that she had emerged victorious. As I stood there with hot dog wrappers and shredded coffee cups swirling near my feet, the smell of something unknowable but funky in the air, I thought that maybe it was all just another illusion, another crimson tinted minefield mindfuck. Allie, I mean, Crimson. all my time with her. <laughs> I think we nailed like 80 80 percent of them. Um, crimson tinted minefield mind fuck. Allie, I mean, in all of my time with her, my belly murmured the bell for another dumpster dive. But before I could stop spying Allie, my Allie, my mind played one last trick on me, sounding far away and echoic. It asked, is love real? The end. <laughs> oh. Man, that felt really strange. 
it felt really strange to read to be reading and have you guys like looking at me through the camera. That was just very strange. <laughs> You're supposed to get used to that though. Go do signings, go do readings, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, preferably with people in the crowd shouting every time you name a certain color. <laughs> Tracy's vigilant, you know, man. Things were like that, more people would show, you know? It's, uh, I need to start doing that. <laughs> oh, uh, speaking of more people showing, Jeffrey Tucker has arrived. Welcome, Jeffrey. It's great to see you. How are you doing this evening? <laughs> no audit. No well, he's working on it. He's working on it. But Lord knows what continent Jeffrey's in. He was recently in New Zealand. He's probably actually inside a helicopter. Handle, there there's a problem with the bandit. There's only so much uh, celebritarian, like famous libertarian, you can handle at once on the call. So, <laughs> so Frank, when you're doing this story, like you know, you and me were talking about uh, finding a finding the right word, like the right trigger word in the story, and you said, "Oh, there's a lot of red in the story." And I thought, "Oh, that's neat," but I kind of filed that away for later. I've been trying to figure out, like. It, was that an intentional, like when you're when you're designing a story, do all the stories in the book like have a color theme? Is there a blue story? Or? You know, that's an interesting question. In this <laughs> story, because I was, it's so telly. It's it, you know, normally writers don't want to tell; they want to show, and that's like the number one rule of writing is show, don't tell. But this story is so telly that I figured I had to use uh, some some kind of symbolism to suggest what is going on with these characters that you don't see and that it's not explicitly stated. And so one way to do that is through, that I came up with this, I mean, this isn't like a known technique, but in my mind I was like, well, if I use red and pink, you know, that will suggest, you know, romance and uh, give, you a, a, give you a taste of it without telling you that that's what happened. Mm. Yeah, yeah, speaking so that was of... The purpose, speaking that was the purpose of, of it. Yeah, speaking of red, I gotta say I love the blood on the cover. Oh, I should show everybody the link to our uh, page for the book. Um, the book that Frank just read from, so that story is called Talk, as in uh, the clock talk, T-A-O-C-K, and uh, it's the first story in the collection of ten stories uh, called Infinite Ending, which is just came out by Frank Markopoulos, I think, one week ago, and has just become free to all Liberty.me members. It's a special deal, special bonus you get for being a member for the next month, so go and pick it up now before it goes away, and it, it's free to you guys until January 15th, which means it's great kind of uh, uh, when you're recovering from New Year's Eve kind of reading, or you're uh, trying to avoid your family uh, kind of reading, so th there it is. And uh, speaking of red, the cover art, I just love the how sanguine, how bloody the, the cover art is for this one. You guys should go take a look at that if you haven't uh, seen it yet. It's bloody without being gory. Oh, okay. Uh, good evening, Meg. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Great to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. I'm going to try to in one ear and to this in the other and stay on camera here <laughs> so they don't... <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, Tracy, uh, you were saying uh, if your book signings were more like this, more people would come. And partly like when Frank and I were dreaming this up, we were trying to think, like, what's something that you just don't get to do with an author normally? <laughs> Drink, yeah. That's, well, especially when you're writing young adult books. You shouldn't be drinking with your readers anyway. But, um, <laughs> yeah, Tracy, no, I usually have, Tracy like, when you... A bowl of candy out, you know, but no, there's no. <laughs> <laughs> when you, Tracy, when you, when you do your events in the schools, in the middle right. schools and stuff, you can't, can't be doing this. 
<laughs> Dude, no way. Um, <laughs> no, I was at a middle school in Cincinnati a couple last month, I think, and uh, it started out with, oh, my niece is in the seventh grade. I'll go visit her classroom. It'll be fun. And then the teacher says, oh, I told the principal, and the principal decided, and they want you to interact with as many students as possible. So we're going to set you up in the media center. We're going to run them through every 20 minutes. So all day long, I think I gave my talk wow. 14 times. I had 15 minutes for lunch and a pee break, and by the end of the day, I was like, you know, what? <laughs> I saw so many children, and it was wonderful. The kids were all great. They were well-behaved, but I was toast by the end of the day. So, you know, hanging out and drinking and talking about it would have been a whole lot easier. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. my stuff isn't really for kids. I, I don't think I could get away with that, uh, but I do yeah, admire that... Um, I do admire that marketing, though. That's I've never heard of that. Uh, that that's fantastic that you do that. Oh, visiting the schools, yeah. It's um, you know, it's been a lot of fun. I was at Flower Mound High School down here uh, north of Dallas yesterday and had a super time. There were about eighty kids that came to an after-school meeting of the English Honor Society to hear me talk, and it was it was just really wonderful. And the feedback's great. They like talking to somebody who has published a book because they kind of aspire to do it too, and it's. Uh, it's a great way to reach my audience. So, and plus, you hook them in early, and they become Tracy Lawson fans for life. Yeah, and then they become Tracy Lawson want. fans for life. You know, <laughs> next book comes out in June, so got to get them on the hook now. That's right. Yeah, yeah long-term planning. That's awesome. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, away from revision. So, so, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's tough. Oh, to great! I'm, I'm glad. Uh, Jeff Riggenbeck, I'm glad your connection uh, came back again. I was worried we'd lost you there, and you and your expansive collection of books. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> I have to put them somewhere. <laughs> I think Bob donated about that many to the Mises Institute when we left Auburn, but I'm not sure. So, uh, <laughs> man. Well, I can hardly I believe wonder... that. No, you go ahead, Frank. Uh, whenever folks are putting their camera like in front of their huge book collection like that, Makes me think they want, they really want me to think they're so super smart. And we know Jeff is super smart, but I think, <laughs> I think he wants everyone to know, look at all these books I've read. <laughs> is that how it works, Jeff? Or? Right, that's the big problem with, with e-book readers now. You can't show them anything. The particular, yeah. <laughs> the particular room I'm in, no matter where, pointed the camera, it would have this kind of a backdrop. So. <laughs> <laughs> and you can probably tell yeah. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> John Hunt says he thinks he recognizes Jeff Riggenbach's shelves from an adult bookstore he once visited for research. I'm not sure if that means Jeff Riggenbach actually lives in an adult bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> That's a matter of how you define adult, you know. <laughs> I just want to get Jeff Riggenbach to keep talking so that way we confuse Matt Gilliland about the nature of reality. <laughs> Very effective well, between been... that and the fact that I'm listening to this and a meeting in the, in the other ear, I'm a bit torn between the planes. <laughs> and I've never known anybody else who's inside their head voice with somebody else's voice. <laughs> you know, I, I have to sometimes, like, I have, I, my inner monologue is very active, like it's just going on all the time, and sometimes I get tired of my own voice, so sometimes there's like Sean Connery in there, or like a cartoon Russian villain, you know, in the Rocky and Bullwinkle thing, so I don't, I don't have a permanent, 
like a permanent guest in my house, like like Matt Gillilad does. Gotcha. Now my characters sometimes talk to me, but that's a little different. I think it's a little different, so. <laughs> Well, I think uh, I think Jeff should get a plaque that says "I am the voice inside Matt Gilliland's head." <laughs> if someone will make that plaque, I'll find a space on the walls, and I might be able to arrange that. <laughs> that that would be fantastic. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> no, uh, there is a, a Jeff Riggenbach novel that is in progress. And uh, who okay. knows whether it will ever be published, but or even be finished. But we'll find out. Self self publish. Well, I've considered that, and uh, I might even do it. You know, uh, Bob Bidinato, the uh, objectivist writer, uh, published self published has self published two books now, and uh, the first one apparently made him a real. Uh, I can't think of a, I usually see, I curse all the time and it's difficult when I'm on camera like this to try to uh, clean up my vocabulary. I started to say, he made, him, up here. Hey, this made, a, made him a whole shitload of money. We're, we're and, among uh, friends here. Yes, well, uh, I, so I know that one can do that successfully, even if one isn't a household name or anything. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I, I'll worry about that later. But what's happening? What's happening right now is a uh, a long uh, sabbatical from the process of continuing to write it, and uh, I need to get back on it and finish it, and then I'll be able to think about publishing. Well, just to give you some more motivation, you, you know, even in self-publishing these days, you can do a self-published audiobook, and of course, you're well known for your voice work, so, you know, there's another avenue for some revenue for you, potentially. Conceivably, yeah. <laughs> So it's kind of a built-in Jeff Riggenbach audience, too, and I don't just mean Matt Gilliland's left and right hemispheres. <laughs> I need oh, some more. Well, now I'm very excited. <laughs> I need some more scotch. I'm going to go off camera here for a while. Just a very short time. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> you know a man takes his drinking seriously when he has to drop off camera completely to get his liquor. Roll the keg into the room. <laughs> when, when Jeffrey Tucker is doing his Liberty Classics uh, classes on Sunday nights, and he says, I'm going to go off camera here and get just a, a small glass of water, and you hear the glass clinking, comes back with a shot glass. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Richard Richard points out that he probably actually there's a secret passage back there. <laughs> The road to serfdom. Yeah, so, so you're in Jeff Riggenbach's uh, room, or his, whichever room that is, his office. 
Which book would you bet, like if you could only touch one book in an attempt to open the secret passage, which book do you think it is on his shelf? Human action, that's a good one. See, I think there's got to be a good title pun waiting to happen here. Now, the reason I had to go <laughs> The reason I had to go completely off camera to get more scotch is because if I stayed on camera, I feared that you would all see what I am not wearing on the lower part of my body. <laughs> Does anyone remember the scene in uh, Casino in which uh, Robert De Niro is sitting at his desk and... Uh, and when he somebody is going to come in to meet him and he has to get up and walk over to the corner and get his pants and put them on. I'm in a similar sort of situation here. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, as far as I can tell, we're all adults here, but, uh, and I've already been accused of living in an adult bookstore, so I suppose it wouldn't have been out of character, but nonetheless, I felt a little shy about it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've now hosted something like 140 Liberty Me live sessions, and none of you have ever seen what kind of pants I'm wearing. Just, just I want you to think about yeah. it. In but fact, we, we have this other coworker, Grant. No, go ahead, Jeff. If you stood up, Matt, would we see what kind of pants you're wearing? If you um, rolled back and stood up? I mean, it's just jeans right now. It's fairly uh, inoffensive, but. Well, you know, we do all dress for the camera, right? You know, so all you got, you just have to look good from, you know, the snappy scarf on up. It's, yeah. Somebody made a comment earlier. Yeah, just want to say. At least, at least 50 sessions have been hosted in pajama pants, but with, with nice shirts. <laughs> That's what matters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I didn't know that this was like um, snappy scarf night. You should have told us well, that ahead of time, Tracy, and we could have all been coordinated. <laughs> I said, I hauled my, I hauled my sorry self up off the sofa to get here. <laughs> I've been down with a cold, you know, that day when you just can't get up off the couch. And it's like, snappy scarf, that's the only thing that's going to pull me through. So here I am. It's uh, feeling much better now. now. What, four or five shots? That's, you know, yeah. the key to success, apparently. So. <laughs> Tracy, you seem very vigorous for someone who, who claims to have been sick all day. Oh, my gosh. I think it must have been all the sleeping on the couch all day. But, yeah, I, I went to the gym at 9, and I haven't done anything since. So, revisions are due, but it does not matter right. today. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I do think you, yeah. I do think you touched on the Hunter S. Thompson uh, key to healthy living. However, oh yeah, just more shots. Yeah, we're, yeah more vodka. Up. Okay, yep. <laughs> I'm not coughing. Hey, Odie. <laughs> <laughs> you said too. something like that kills, kills all the germs. I, I, I would never recommend uh, drugs and alcohol to anyone else, but they've always worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Good show, Jeff. Hey, they work. Well, they sure. Work Yesterday, one of the kids asked me, "What do you do for What do you do for writer's block?" And he's like, "No." <laughs> well, you have lots of things you can do for writer's block. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> do you guys use that method too, Frank? Uh, Jeff, yeah. do, do you drink to beat writer's block? I sure do. <laughs> You know what's weird is I can write, I can write uh, like poetry while drinking alcohol, things that don't have to be coherent or connected, you know, kind of sporadic thoughts. But I can't write fiction that way. I'd have I have to use uh, caffeine as the liquid of choice there. Mm -hmm. Caffeine's good too. Huh. If I drink and if I smoke. Uh, I write more smoothly and uh, for longer periods 
without having to uh, quit or having difficulty with it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the state of Texas uh, has elected to protect me from the dangers of smoking. Uh, that wasn't the case in California, so, uh, you know, that part of my preparation for writing has been cramped somewhat uh, since I've been in Texas, but uh, drinking is almost always possible. I prefer beer, and uh, Texas also protects me from buying beer at the wrong times of week the wrong hour of the day, things of that sort, mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, it's sometimes difficult to have beer around. How thoughtful of them. Uh, yes. Yeah, here in, here in Texas, we have the Alcoholic Beverage Commission, the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, and that's to keep everyone here safe with the alcohol. And they actually break people up from, from <laughs> making their own moonshine and such. And to make sure they really do. all go to to make sure that we all have an opportunity to go to church on Sunday uh, because we aren't too drunk, you know. I mean, we wouldn't right. sell beer and wine before noon because <laughs> then people might get drunk and forget to go to church. Thankfully, here in North Carolina, our ABC stores only protect us from liquor. <laughs> so beer and wine, you're, you're just left unprotected. I mean, I, I think it's uh, it's it's useful <laughs> for the churches to be able to get the communion wine, you know, the morning of. They don't have to think ahead so much. And we can all have a, a beer or two before the service. <laughs> you would think you would think it would enhance your church going experience. You would think they might want to encourage that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Catholics and the especially. Australia. Know, we Espe especially, since, especially since uh, Jesus turned water into wine. I mean, you know, allegedly. Oh gosh, Bob had a nice <laughs> discussion with a little lady at church one time who was convinced that it was Jesus only drank grape juice. It didn't matter what the Bible said. Jesus only drank grape juice. <laughs> well, you oh, my, uh, grand, my grandmother was, was a dedicated teetotaler through her whole life and uh, swears she never had a drink at all. Um, but the, the, one, the one time that we, don't really, we didn't really talk about in front of her is at my mother and father's wedding, Uncle Wally, the one-armed bandit, spiked the punch. And Grandma really liked the punch at Mom and Dad's wedding. <laughs> 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 but you can't ruin that for her. You couldn't have ruined that for her, you know, because she would have been crushed. No. No. No, you just, you just let that one go. <laughs> I mean, saintly woman. <laughs> oh, yes. What did he put in the punch? Vodka? Yeah, that is a great question. I should, I should ask. That's a key part of the family lore. <laughs> Probably gin, you know, because gin is the sneakiest of all alcohols. Really? Like the easiest to spike someone's punch with? Well, it's <laughs> sneaky because, because if you mix it with stuff, you kind of don't taste it so much. And you think, oh, uh, this, there's nothing in this. And you start drinking it down, and then all of a sudden, you're wasted. White rum is pretty <laughs> tequila, yeah, but tequila, yeah, gonna... tequila is, uh, yeah, I agree with Zachary in the in the <laughs> room too. Tequila, tequila can be pretty, uh, depending on if you have the high quality tequila. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of with Jeff Regan back up uh, in having. Uh, uh, yes, I'm I'm drinking liquor this evening, but I have been. Um, a beer drinker for a while, and that's what gets the writing done for me, is uh, <laughs> Jeff showing off the, the rye again, I think. Uh, it's scotch. Uh, scotch. 
Yeah, beer is definitely better because it uh, you get modified much more slowly. <laughs> I like th I like that word. <laughs> Mo modified. modified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you're sober. When you're sober, you're irregular. You're you're off. And when you have a few drinks, you, you become regular or modified. Yeah. It modifies your awareness. Yeah. Yeah. One of my friends said that uh, <laughs> when you did that, you're, you're so strange. Like when you drink, it's not like you get angrier or like any of the, the personality traits that most people get when drinking. You just get more mad. There you go. What does that What does that mean? You get smarter or Oh, I see. Or Matt. Yes. I, I think it just magnifies all of my personality traits. So it's not that they change, so, they just become more so somehow. So you'll like make three delicious meals at a time instead of one? <laughs> well <laughs> I, I don't know how to so only use one Matt's coming in a little choppy. Yes. It might be because I'm in two of these at once. And Mike Reed is now inaudible. A joke too. Let me try again. Matt, I'm going to get the tech genius Matt Gilliland to help you straighten that out. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the tech around no, here? No, no, no. You need the tech team. You, Not me. Well, but yeah, but, but, if, but if Matt is having the problem, then you need to get the tech of uh, Meg Gilliland on, on the case. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Meg is far more qualified for anything tech-related. <laughs> I don't know. Matt, Matt I, I, I was unable to read it. That sarcasm, is, is Meg actually uh, having trouble in that area? No, Meg, Meg is great with tech. I'm, I have trouble with anything that's outside of my direct wheelhouse. Like, I can build a computer, but if something goes wrong with a program, I'm totally lost. So really the value add to your marriage is all cooking. Is that right? That's the whole thing? Um, cooking, entertainment. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very good at illegal downloading, uh, illegally downloading movies and television shows for us to watch. Uh, I, I can pick out good alcoholic beverages. I've, I've got more than just one, uh, one good trait, but no, I, I think that if I had to ride on the cooking, I could probably keep her around with just that. Yeah, it sounds like you're just a very advanced sort of butler. And everybody's <laughs> got to bring something to a marriage, right? You know, it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and that was oh. that was really cruel because Matt, Matt posted this uh, picture of what he was making on Facebook. Like, on the same day that I had... On the same day that I had just gone to Target and gotten this stupid, like, cracker and cheese and pepperoni platter thing, like, in a moment of weakness, and then, I, and then I, I come home and I have to look at, here's my delicious meal I just made. I was like, man, F this guy. <laughs> <laughs> with, his, with his delicious meals. Make him, make him adopt the policy of making deliveries. You know, he can cook the meal there in North Carolina and then deliver it to Austin. <laughs> well, that, would be, that would be great, but he'd probably have to do, like, time travel first or something. You know, like. I, I don't know. I think with one of, those, uh, one of those dry ice containers, I could give you reheating instructions. I, I mean, uh, my chili, for example, freezes wonderfully, and I usually make it in a, a four-gallon stock pot. So I could I could send you a a giant uh, 
plastic bag full of chili. You know, I would pay for that. I would pay for that. In, in New York, we had something called Fresh Direct, which was similar to what we're talking about. There's no, nothing like that in Texas that I can find, at least in Austin. So we could call this Matt Direct. And this would be a this this is a beautiful entrepreneurial idea, I think. Yeah, just get Meg to set up the Amazon drones to carry it around to places. Yeah. yeah. If people see now you're thinking, Mike away, Reed. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I have a friend that calls the Amazon drones skeet shooting with prizes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you could even do that. <laughs> Free meal to the best shot, you know, send a drone. You have to pack the meal really well. Really, Unless it's really chili. Well. Like, just like chili yeah. in a vacuum pack. Vacuum packed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Double wrapped in plastic and shrink wrapped and yeah, totally. That's like a, that's like a new form of skeet shooting. Right. Yes. Yes. Skeet shooting for dinner instead of bowling for dollars. You could have, could have skeet for dinner. Skeet shooting for dinner. <laughs> I like it. See, it's we didn't know dinner, that this right? room. We didn't know that. <laughs> we didn't know that this room was going to become like an incubator for like the next generation of uh, awesome uh, entrepreneurial ideas. Yeah, you never know <laughs> when you show up to one of these things. Where it's going to go, so it's cool. <laughs> you get a bunch of authors together and pump them full of alcohol. Uh, I mean, it, there's no shortage of imagination in the room. True sure enough. This, this is the brilliance of Mike Reed. <laughs> oh, Mike Reed speaking, but he was he, muted, so I'm not sure. Yeah, Mike is still muted. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you're not allowed to be muted, man. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta be running this thing. We're, <laughs> we're, off, the rails, we're, we're off the rails, man. <laughs> How deep is the well, snow? It's sufficiently like. modified, apparently. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, the snow outside my place is about a foot. Deep, maybe a little less, and it actually melted a little bit today. We had some freak weather that took us above freezing. Um, uh, so it's, it's not too bad yet. Last year, we got a good three feet, and then the melt happens. You had this frozen crust, and I live on a very, like, absolutely flat plain. Like, you look on my house, you go to the road, you can see the horizon. Like, it just goes and goes and goes. And so last year, I was able to take my daughter in a sled and run on top of the snow crust over the farmer's fields. I don't know if I'm going to get that this year. <laughs> but if it melted wow. today, then it'll freeze overnight, and you'll have ice all over the sidewalks tomorrow. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I had to turn around. I was going into the big city. The big city is Winnipeg, which is slightly under a million people. And I was um, going to trying to drive in yesterday, but there was a headwind, and there was ice, and I just like had to turn the car around. <laughs> I had to go back and get the van, which is like better tires and it's heavier so it stays on the road. I don't I don't understand. I, I live I live in Austin and um when it rains in the winter time here and there is a possibility of ice, everything closes. The possibility of ice. Yeah. <laughs> Not even real I ice. Think, I think Dallas <laughs> said they laid in a supply of, of salt and sand. I think they said they had thirty tons of salt. For the city of Dallas with seven million people, and uh, you know, it's like gracious, they're, they're not expecting Dallas. to get much. But Dallas, I don't understand because you guys, you, you guys get weather up there. I mean, they should, we, we be, they should be more prepared. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, we're prepared for once every two or three years, I guess. But it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure the city of Columbus, Ohio, where I came from, to move to Dallas probably stocks 10, 12 times the amount of salt that Dallas does, and it's, you know, the city's seven times the size of Columbus, so it's uh, it's interesting down here. We had that ice storm last, uh, right after Thanksgiving. My daughter's a freshman, was a freshman at SMU at the time, and a lot of her Southern California friends had never seen snow before. Those kids were crawling on their hands and knees to class because they did not know how to do ice. It was hilarious. And, uh, <laughs> and they, uh, they had, they had 
throw the grounds crew out with leaf blowers trying to melt the ice off the sidewalk so the kids could get to class because they did not have anything to deal with the snow. <laughs> well, and so, I think of course, you know, my daughter's storm, in Ohio really and she's like, come on, you can. Yeah, but there was a story about some guy who got, tra he didn't have any food in his house and he couldn't get to the grocery store, so he had to like walk some insane amount of mileage to go try and find some ramen noodles and was on the side of the road slipping and sliding and, and he was like, you know, because uh, he got stuck for like three days or something like that. Yeah, in Canada we have a system yeah, for that. It's called, it's called having neighbors. It's like, <laughs> not here, not in American cities. I don't know. I live in a, I live in an apartment complex. I don't know anyone who lives here. <laughs> not one person. And I know that's not a good risk management strategy, but <laughs> um, here, when there's a whole fleet of. Uh, snow plows, like basically like front end loaders, and for six months of the year, there's this team of like 300 guys who are employed to drive these things around the city and clear the snow, and they pile it up in a gigantic pile of snow on the edge of town, and by the end of the year, it's the biggest hill in central Manitoba, like it's bigger than the snow hills, and the, the, the trucks actually drive up on top of it to dump the snow up at the peak of the hill. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, guys, I, <laughs> I'm gonna start. I gotta start wrapping it up here, guys. Um, so I'm gonna uh, start by thanking everyone. This is the most fun thing I have ever done. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was really fun. <laughs> yeah, I can send you some sort of. This was the best. <laughs> There's so yeah. many entrepreneurial ideas. We're all going to be rich. Totally rich. <laughs> <laughs> Just start by drone flying Chili to Jeff Rickenback's house, and he'll shoot it down. I'll shoot it down if it goes over the house, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. This is this is really a, a great innovation. It's really Frank and I that no, it's really Frank that, that dreamed this up. Frank was saying he wanted to do something different, and uh, so this has been great. Jeff Rigenbach, thanks for joining us. Tracy Lawson, Matt Gilliland's okay too. Uh, Richard Masta, it's great to talk with you again. And Zachary and Ken J, who I have all, I always thought Ken J's name was Kenj, like Kenji. I thought he was Japanese. I didn't get that his name was Ken J. <laughs> so it's great to see everybody. Uh, John Hunt was here. He talked to us. He, he couldn't come on camera, but then uh, he, he asked me to say goodbye to him. So I can't say uh, John Hunt says goodbye to everybody. Um, I'm going to just do a couple things before we totally shut it down. And that is first I'm going to give you guys some links to some more cool Liberty.me live stuff that's coming up. Then I'll give you a couple of links to some great Frank Markopoulos stuff that's coming up. And then... Uh, we'll all just say goodbye to each other at once. <laughs> we'll like wave and say goodbye at like, the end of a of an episode of um, uh, Rumpus Room, or, 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 like that kids show where everybody appears on screen at once. Um, okay, so let me talk new live stuff. I want to tell you guys that Love Hate in the State, which is about the psychology of emotion as it relates to how we express ourselves in politics, why people are so attracted to uh, trusting in a state, and so on. Uh, Zach Slayback's class is coming back again. And that is uh, Thursday night of this week. Uh, sorry, that's later on tonight at uh, 9.30. So, geez, that's not very long from now, 9.30. About half an hour from now. Uh, then we also have a very unusual or a very neat little piece uh, called Unconventional Living. It's the art of Bitcoin-only travel. So this, people are always saying, well, I would buy Bitcoin if I could actually buy things with it. Well, now you can travel just using Bitcoin. And you can accommodations, uh, food, everything. So uh, there it is. And that one is coming on Saturday at uh, 8, same time we started uh, tonight. Um, so those are two Libby.me live things that are coming up. I also want to make sure that I give you guys uh, a couple of links to great Frank Markopoulos stuff. I already showed you the link to the book that we have. 
Uh, thanks, Frank, for giving this book, donating the book to all the members for the next month. It's a wonderful we're sharing thing. It's great to have authors come in into the community and do that. Value for everybody, so that's great. Go check that book out. Um, if you miss it, uh, you can still buy the dang thing on Amazon. The Amazon link is there. The, uh, the other thing to get from Frank Markopoulos, he's got this great pu uh, publishing site uh, called D-Block. And I'm just looking. <laughs> I would be totally prepared, prepared with this link if I had not been drinking amaretto all evening. <laughs> and this is uh, ending library, infinite ending. Uh, so here is the uh, page for the event, and that page uh, links to the book, and the book page uh, also links to Frank's publishing site, and it also has a great link there to the Austin Writing Workshop. I don't, I don't know if uh, Frank hasn't been really pushing that too hard tonight, uh, but that is an ongoing podcast where it's kind of like this, like Frank and a whole bunch of other people are talking, and it's coming, this book that we're we were talking about earlier tonight, really comes out of this writing workshop. Um, it's something that's been, that's been worked on by those people, and so that's a fun podcast uh, for anybody who's into writing, maybe if Jeff Regenbach's uh, looking for a way to, to motivate himself to finish up that novel we all need, check out the Austin Writing Workshop. Uh, so that's some, that's some great links to some more Frank Markopoulos stuff. Frank, do you want to say anything before we all say bye? I uh, just thank you. I think this was a great event. Um, you know, I, I think I really like the format. So it seems like uh, everyone enjoyed it. And, you know, uh, let, let's keep it up. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for coming to Liberty.me Live. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.